real life monopoly man Jeff Bezos has come out in support of Black Lives Matter, y'all. Okay, Bezos recently shared an email from an irate customer that was incredibly upset about Amazon.com's decision to support Black Lives Matter. And she even said all lives matter in the email. He explained to this customer that he believes in the movement and understands the struggles of the black community. And then he went on to donate $10 million to social justice causes. And in other news, Jeff Bezos has won the Oscar for the greatest actor of all time. Now, <clears throat> I am sure that there are some of you that are shocked at my statement. Right, Krish? Come on. The guy's out there. He's doing his best. He said that he supports the movement. How can you be so cynical? <clears throat> so let's explore the situation for just a minute. Now, Jeff Bezos, the man that is well on his way to become the first trillionaire on the planet, that's trillion with a T, got an email personally from a customer. Look, if it was that easy to contact billionaire CEOs of massive corporations, I would be having conversations with Tim Cook of Apple on the daily about planned obsolescence. Okay, I, I'm supposed to believe that Macy from Idaho just had Jeffy B's email ready to go. There is no way that this wasn't staged. Secondly, uh, if he was supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and has always supported the Black Lives Matter movement, why did he fire a black man in March for saying that Amazon didn't care about his life or any of their employees' lives? Right? Chris Malls was fired for revealing that Amazon knew employees testing positive for COVID-19, but told their managers to keep everybody else working. And then they fired him for organizing a strike. That's not supporting black lives. Now, the reason he staged this statement is to make sure that when the revolution comes for what's ours, we leave him alone. And lastly, he's donating $10 million to social justice causes as he's about to become a trillionaire. I mean, he's made over $25 billion dollars per, uh, of, of personal profits during this pandemic 10 million dollars is like nothing to him you know it's like a suburbanite that gives a homeless person a quarter and feels good about themselves for helping you know quote unquote helping if bezos wanted to help he would give his weight in donations to every single social justice movement in america but this is just a long string of performative politics employed by corporations and politicians alike to get us back on the complacency teats, right? My friend Eleanor Goldfield calls it the struggle theater in her most recent Mint Press News article. And we have been seeing these performances given by the uber rich out of touch politicians while real performance performers are out of work and given nothing from a government that claims to give a shit about them. It's a distraction to stroke their own egos, and we the people need to stop falling for it. Right, Nancy Pelosi has been putting on a show for the past two years. Everyone screamed, Yas, Queen, when she tore up Trump's speech at the State of the Union address while ignoring how quickly she gave a standing ovation to Guan Guaido, the fake imperialistic coup president of Venezuela. If she would have gotten if she could have gotten up any faster, she would have flown off into the stands and automatically filleted Guaido in support of his false presidency. And, and I, you know, that, that image is now, uh, it, 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 we just can't get rid of that image. Everybody is, everybody is suffering from that image. But, but I think the point is worth it. Pelosi also pretended to read from a Bible to mock Trump. For someone that hates socialism as much as she does, she is willing to use the book of a socialist that, you know, for a photo op. America screamed, double yas queen, as she shoved Medicare for all in prison and declined universal basic income for struggling Americans. 
Then the Democrats famously wore kente cloths and kneeled for eight minutes to show support for the Black Lives Matter movement, only to turn around and pass a no shit legislation where they banned things like chokeholds and said murder is bad. Yeah, no shit, Democrats. How about you change the structure of policing and fund things that actually need funding, like social programs, community development, education, mental health programs, instead of your vapid displays of performative politics that nobody gives a shit about. In Washington, D.C., you had Mayor Muriel Bowser paint the Black Lives Matter on the streets leading up to the White House. In her article, Eleanor Goldfield points out that activist and journalist Jack Jacque Lookman, God, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, she recently wrote, Muriel Bowser doesn't even like black people in her own city. This means nothing. It does nothing for us. It doesn't help us. It doesn't improve schools, doesn't get rid of spouse abusing fascist top cop she loves so much in reference to Metro Police Chief, uh, Chief Newsom. Doesn't stop gentrification of poor black neighborhoods, doesn't improve affordable housing, doesn't change any of the lack of progress she has made on any of those things. All of these performative politics is art jacking. These are elites stealing from other artists and communities and stealing from the artists and the communities that they serve. Okay, look, artists are of the people, right? Real transformative art doesn't come from the economic elites. It comes from right here on the ground. It comes from the people that grew up in underserved neighborhoods that communicate their struggles through beauty and creativity to empower those neighborhoods they come from. Artists have always been on the pulse of what's really going on and push back against those at the top. Artists are a vital part of any movement and revolution. These theatrics are robbing the people of real art and making a mockery of it. Now these performances also use social issues as a scapegoat to distract us away from the courts upholding the status quo. Right. Recently, the Supreme Court's ruled that people in the LGBTQ community can't be fired for their identities. And they recently also overturned a Trump ruling against DACA, ensuring that immigration provisions stay in place. Now, these are common sense things that should have already been in place anyway. Right? A society that legalized gay marriage should have ensured the rights of the working class in the LGBTQ community. And there has been a call to reform the immigration system for over a decade. So why are we applauding the courts for doing something they should have done decades ago? But ru these rulings were passed simultaneously as the courts declined to overturn any qualified immunity cases for cops that murder people. Qualified immunity basically says, well, cops going to cop. It's an excuse for the courts to allow cops to commit their acts of brutality, murder civilians, break into people's homes, take their money, and have zero accountability for it. I mean, lawyers have fought for qualified immunity because they say the people in these sort of positions of power shouldn't have to go through, you know, frivolous lawsuits. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just so frivolous to, to want justice and the cops to, to, to be held to some kind of standard, you know, just like the same standard as everybody else. I mean, this is proof that cops are not part of the working class in America because the Supreme Court is keeping qualified immunity to uphold the frivolity of innocent lives lost at the hands of the thin blue line. During the Harlow versus Fitzgerald case in 1982, the Supreme Court said that monetary compensation is the only realistic avenue. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, the Supreme Court ruling justifies reparations on all levels, right? I mean, if black, brown, or any member of the working class that has been oppressed by the capitalistic system is owed a pretty large check made out to cash because fuck your banks. The courts didn't rule to hold violent and murderous cops accountable for their crimes, but rather gave them a green light to do it with their robed blessings. 
So let's look at all the other cases that the precious Supreme Court used to vaccinate the ruling to protect cops from the big bad unarmed civilians they constantly brutalize. The Hunter versus Bryant case used qualified immunity to excuse warrantless searches. The Saucier versus Katz case used qualified immunity to protect cops and then let them use excessive force. The Brousseau versus Hagen case used qualified immunity to protect a cop after he shot someone in the back for fleeing. The San Francisco versus Sheehan case used qualified immunity to protect a cop for repeatedly shooting a mentally ill person. The Plumhoff versus Ricard case used qualified immunity to allow cops to use excessive force to stop a vehicle. The Utah versus Strife case justified searching citizens without reasonable suspicion or probable cause. And police under qualified immunity are justified to carry out no-knock warrants, which got Breonna Taylor killed. Qualified immunity also allows cops to use a breathalyzer, take your DNA, draw your blood, and use the fear for my life rationale as an excuse. And look, people buy the fear of life argument, you know, because there are cops breaking down over egg McMuffins. So clearly when someone says, hands up, don't shoot, that's a trigger warning, like literally. Okay, odd, odd that they cry over like an egg McMuffin but not over robbing someone of their life. At this point, the courts are basically letting mentally unstable sociopaths protect us by waging a war on our streets. And guess what? War is scary. It's not Medal of Honor. You don't get points for killing civilians. But remember, we all have to vote for a Democrat so that they have control over these courts you know, the, the same courts that for over 40 years have been giving the police the permission to kill us on our own streets. Look, I am thrilled that my alphabet brothers and sisters don't have to worry about being fired for who they are. I'm also tr thrilled that my fellow immigrant brothers and sisters have to worry a lot less about deportations. But this victory is being used by the oligarchs as a breadcrumb to ensure that they can take the rest of our rights away from us as we celebrate, right? We can celebrate these victories while keeping our eyes open and our ears to the ground. This is the time for all of us to stand up and push back on their struggle theater. Not to say, well, Chris, come on. Yeah, at least, at least we don't have slavery. You know, that's kind of cool. That's pretty cool right there. First of all, that's not a particularly accurate statement with prison slavery and wage slavery, but saying that statement just gives these people, gives these politicians more permission to give us breadcrumbs when we need a full meal. Complacency is the greatest of all American traditions, and that's what these performative politics do. They keep us complacent. Apathy is the greatest feat of American culture. And retweeting this struggle, th this, this big struggle theater, only shows that you support it. But complacent and apath complacency and apathy are no longer luxuries that the faux resistance can afford. It's because the real resistance is at your door and it's not going away because you bought a Black Lives Matter t-shirt from Amazon. We're here because you bought a BLM t-shirt from a corporate warmonger and you think that's fine and good enough. If I may take a moment to generalize, the, the people I see that are falling for these theatrics from the elites are good-natured white liberals that covet their NPR and channel their vokeness by watching the TV show Blackish. These folks are the ones that fear ideas like defund the police and equate it to riots and criminality. They also like to quote Martin Luther King Jr., but often miss the point. So let's look at what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. actually said. He has said, and quote, a riot merely intensifies the fear of the white community while relieving the guilt. And I must say tonight that a riot is a language of the unheard. And what it is, um, what is it America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the, of the Negro 
poor has worsened over the last 12 or 15 years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been yelled, have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society and more, are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice and humanity. We are calling for justice while the struggle theater and its complacent compatriots want their tranquility back, turning a blind eye to a much bigger problem. They look at these performances to be as good, if not better, than legislation. They haven't taken the time to learn their own history and understand the point, understand the point where minority communities can't call the cops for protection. That's a privilege and a luxury for a, a lot of folks, but it isn't for us. We in the minority community have had to fear financial imprisonment, regular imprisonment, and even death. None of us wants to be a hashtag, but it seems the only way these rich white liberals hear what we ha have been saying for, for generations now. Look, these are concessions because the oligarchy and their hired thugs in the police departments are scared. This is not the time to stop or accept weak compromises. This is the time to tell the so-called leaders to leave the performance to us and start doing their job, which is govern with the people's best interest in mind. The compromise isn't painting the streets. It's defunding the police and reinvesting into community initiatives that mean less of us dead in our own streets. It's giving us a chance to live our lives in the best conditions possible. We are here to say that we are not going to compromise on our own equality. Uh, I am continuing the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows every single Friday, 9 p.m. Tickets are available right now. If you're listening to this on the day that it comes out, June 19th, we're doing a Juneteenth special. Uh, tickets are available for that right now, but we got shows coming up on June 26th, July 10th, July 17th, August 7th, August 14th, and August 28th. We might be going well into the fall with these as well. So grab your tickets. You can grab tickets to multiple shows um, if you would like to. Every single show is going to be different. Every single show has a different theme. We're going to be bringing different segments back, updating certain bits. Uh, so uh, it's a new experience every single time. So if you want to grab your tickets, you can grab your tickets right on my website at krishmohan.com. It's a $5 minimum. Uh, and the uh, ticket will give you access to the virtual theater, the virtual theater. So getting those tickets is important. That's how I'm going to be able to communicate the login information for Zoom. Uh, I know that sounds a little cumbersome, but it makes sure that we uh, don't get any unwanted visitors, those Zoom bombers in our show, and everybody has a good time, and uh, we all get to enjoy enjoy the show. So make sure you grab your tickets. Like I said, it's a $5 minimum. Not only that, but uh, I'm going to be donating half the ticket sales every single week to a different grassroots organization, mutual aid, uh, or, or, you know, t small grassroots DIY venue. Uh, this week on June 19th, we're going to be donating to Level Up Studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They are a POC-run creative playground, is how they describe themselves. And uh, they, they do a lot. They teach dance. They do uh, shows and open mics. And um, uh, they're, they're a recording studio. They do a ton of stuff. And they're all about community engagement. They're all about... Uh, empowering their community, um, especially empowering um, uh, young black kids in their in their neighborhoods. So that's who we're going to be donating uh, half of our ticket sales from June nineteenth. You can grab your tickets right now, uh, and and each week is going to be like I said, it's going to be different. So you can grab uh, tickets to multiple shows if you would like to. Check out those links in the description. Um, the other thing you can do as well is by uh, becoming a sustaining member. Uh, over, uh, you can do that right on my website as well, krishmohan.com. Uh, you can become a member directly on my website. You can become a sustaining member on Patreon and on Bandcamp. Uh, Patri if you become a sustaining member, you automatically get free tickets to the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows. 
free tickets to those comes right at you, which is pretty cool. You also get a bunch of other bonus perks like unreleased material, early access to certain videos that uh, you only you get to see and nobody else gets to see. So uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff by becoming a sustaining member. If you can become a sustaining member, it's not necessary, but uh, you can also make one-time donations to help out the show as well. Uh, and lastly, I also have a new album out called Politely Angry, which is available on all of your favorite streaming, downloading platforms. And uh, more importantly, it's available on Bandcamp. And the, the reason why I'm talking about the Bandcamp more than I'm talking about any of the other stuff is because on Bandcamp, it's available for $1 and it's super affordable. Nobody gets priced out. Uh, and you get bonus tracks. You get two bonus tracks exclusively only available on Bandcamp. Um, so go to my website, krishmohan.com, check out all of those things, support all uh, your, your, your favorite independent, socially conscious DIY stand-up comedian, and help out a good cause. Help out a grassroots venue or a grassroots organization, mutual aid, that sort of stuff. And you'll be helping communities across America grow a little bit. So uh, grow, get your tickets download an album, become a sustaining member, go to krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N. Uh, thank you guys so much.